the story of our army. This is the Drujina, army of Kyiv Prince. And this our voice, voice, the militia of Kyiv. And this is the Drujina, army of a Moscow Prince and his fighters. To tell the truth, it is 200 years later. But actually, we cannot see a big difference. And here they are, Ukrainian warriors, in the Lithuanian host, in the 15th century. And here they are in Polish host, the same century. And this are Moscow arquebuses, souvenirs, at the very same time, and we can see essential differences. Well, these are Ukrainian Cossacks. As you can see, they are unlike Moscow shooters or records. Well then, let's try and see how and when the traditions and differences of Ukrainian and Russian troops began to form. And let's find out why our army is more effective than the one of the neighboring country. The host of the Asian Rus. The Ukrainian host has a long and interesting history. The Slavic voice were described yet in 6th century by Byzantine historian Prokopian Cesari and in 7th century by strategicon Mauritius and the Slavic voice were recalled by Benedictine monk Pavlo Diakon and in various Arab and Persian sources of the time. By the way, the name of the military leaders, Vaivoda, is derived from the word voy. It is a lyrical digression, so to say. As soon as the Slavs got their princess, the latter started to gather Drujina around themselves. There are theories that at first it was made up of Varyaks, but at length it was Ukrainianized, and later local boyars only were its members. At war, they always stayed close to the prince, and they got boarding, lands and other privileges instead. The Chronicles recalls Vladimir the Great being so benevolent to his Drujina that they turned naughty. Once at the feast, they started complaining and reprehending the prince. It is awful, we are set to eat with wooden spoons, but not silver ones. After the prince had heard that, he ordered to forge silver spoons for this Drujina and keep saying, with silver and gold I won't get any Drujina, but with my Drujina I will get both silver and gold. Quite often we can find in chronicles that when the prince had to leave the lands under some circumstances, boyars should manifest loyalty following him. In 1150 Prince Izislav was praising his army for that. The host itself was divided into the older and the younger one. The older, or the first one, consisted of great boyars, representatives of the most powerful boyar kinships. The younger one was represented by less rich and outstanding boyars. It was the first step in their career ladder. So, in 1169, when the older Drujina refused to follow Prince Vladimir Mstislavovich, he pointed at the younger ones and said, they will be my boyars. One more big part of the Asian Russian host was the general militia, which was called Wizvoy. If someone attacked the country from outside, all the population grabbed any arms and went to defend their land. Soon, princes started to use the militia for the external military campaigns. Both the Drujina and the militia had the right of spoils of war and booties, which attracted the population most of all. The host of an Apanich princess looked the same way as the host of Kiev prince did at the time when Rus started falling into separate lands. And what was it like with the neighbors? Almost the same organization structure was inherited by northern and eastern prince dorms Volodymyrske and Moskovske. Apart from the fact it was many years later and the host was not full-scale developed because of the Mongols who considered it important to debilitate the military force there. Thus the host was run by Moscow princes to collect tribute for those same Mongols and suppress rebellions on the neighboring lands. This was the story of the host at the time of Kyiv Rus. So, let's make the following scheme. Drujina and boyars of Rus were the counterparts of knights in Europe. Void general host or militia. Well, heading further. Lithuania times. After Ukrainian lands got under the jurisdiction of the Great Duchy of Lithuania, the Lithuanian host was reinforced by Ukrainian warriors. At the beginning, he had the same structure. 
as the ones of the princes. There were boyars and militia, but the latter gradually lost its significance. Instead, Lithuanian knights strived to develop a knight and boyar army. As everywhere in the Middle Ages, boyars were in the service for receiving big plots of land. Lithuanian princes went further. A new rule was introduced, requiring all owners of land plots to serve in the army. In the other case, the land was taken away. The law covered all segments of the population from princes to fizants. Lithuanian princes were generously given out the lands, and the army was increasing. Ukrainians took part in almost all wars of GDL, and there were a lot of our warriors, and they fought dexterously. It is enough to take a look at some great battles of the times. Grunwald Battle, 1410. Battle of Porsche, 1514. Polish Times. Poland had not had its own constant army for a long time. If any danger broke out, the king summoned Slechta, Polish nobility, Pospolit Ruszynia, and then every representative of the Polish gentry went to war with his own warband. So, if he came from Ukraine lands, from Halicina or Podilia, there were Ukrainian-speaking records, and the great part of Rech Pospolita consisted of mercenaries. And the main force in the Polish army was cavalrymen. Who knows not the Polish winger hussars? and infantry played the secondary role. Besides mercenaries, there was Lanova or Vibranitska infantry then. The name stems from the form of enlistment. A village had to provide one soldier to infantry, Vibranets, for every 20 lands of lands, an old unit of field measurement used in Poland. They were liberated from all kind of taxes and duties, and in that very infantry found themselves Ukrainian fiazans. But there were not numerous in the Polish host. Halicina gave up to 200, Holmshina and Pidlasia 200, Podzilla 300 people. There was not any army on Moscow lands, was there? Why don't you mention it? Or were there only orcs at service? Well, okay, I can tell. Host of Moscovia. At first, the tradition of Rus was kept, a Druzhina divided into the older and younger ones. Later, it was transformed into the prince's court and a regiment that was provided by every other prince dorm or city. Starting from the 15th century, the Druzhina and city regiments were replaced with feudal groups headed by Boyarin, who brought his children, subordinates, servants and fighting villains. That is to say, the classical feudal system was formed. A monarch extended lands to nobility only if they fought for him. Main disadvantage of such an army were a very slow speed of turnout, absence of military training. Every soldier armed himself at his own sweet will. What can we say if half of the entire army consisted of fighting villains? Their status was a bit higher than the one of ordinary Bandar Thiazans and their main task was to protect the life of the landlord and guard his essence in a vagant train. Moreover, they kept rummaging and seeking booties in the name of their master since their own rate of being satat depended directly on him. Very often in hungry years, an owner didn't have any possibility to feed his fighting villains and drove them away from the yard. Then the latter committed plunder or formed bands and went to the free outskirts on the banks of Don, Volha or Iaik. It is no wonder that with such a host, in 14-16 centuries, Muscovia almost didn't have serious military victories on the west against Lithuania and Poland, and on the south against Tatars, and all its expansions was directed to the north and east against defenseless neighbors. When the firearm appeared, Moscovier procured arquebuses, replaced later with strelets and cannon finders. Strelets, a soldier in a regular army in Moscovia in the 16th-17th century. All of them were in regular army and got money for the service. And I would like to talk about arquebuses and strelets in a bit detailed way. Arquebuses are mentioned in the chronicles starting from the late 15th century. 
The military elite was armed and gone for the account of fees of the population. For 50 years of the early 16th century, they took part in all the wars of the Moscow Duchy. And then they tried to prove something to the Grand Prince Ivan the Formidable, 1546. The delegation went to him, which he refused to accept. And what more, he ordered to bid them. About 10 people died as a result of the scuffle between fellow courtiers and arquebusiers. The latter were deformed as a military unit, and another regular host was created. Strilecki – shooters. Strilci were free people. Their service was considered honored, though it was lifelong. They were paid for the job, liberated from all the taxes. But even those soldiers of Moscovia were eliminated. But at that time, it was the other side, Peter I. In 1699, more than a thousand shooters were executed on the Red Square in Moscow. And it is only for the attempt to address that side. After that, the armed forces of Moscow state were formed exclusively by recruiting method. The service became cursive and long life. Residents of villages and cities provided a certain number of records. Then a person was sent off to the army, as if to the great beyond, with a lot of tears and groaning. The record was seen buried alive. Difficult service conditions, corporal punishment, active duty casualties in never-ending wars conducted by the Russian Empire resulted in a low number of people who served all 25 years. According to reports of the Inspector Department of Military Ministry of the Russian Empire as of 1820, no more than 3,500 of soldiers served 25 years service out of 826 Southend. People were brought to the army under guard, records and soldiers from the left bank Ukraine, knowing what was ahead in the Russian army, fled to the west. In 1798, the governor of Kamenets Podilsky informed in his report that there was a Ulan regiment on the border with the Valin governorate, which was almost remained by Russian deserters on a voluntary basis. The soldiers of the Imperial Army differed a lot from the Ukrainian Cossacks. Voluntary service always gave him the advantages of a free man. It is brightly illustrated in art. Can you compare two paintings by Ilya Repin? So, let's speak about the Cossack army. Almost all above-mentioned military formations were of state character. Kazachina was a folk army from the very beginning. Cossacks continued traditions of Bahatirs in the ancient Rus and the ones of steppe-free riders. After all, from the Turkic languages, Kozak is translated as a knight of steppes, free and armed man. In our history, this image was not always true to fact, but it has become an example of an ideal free person. Cossacks appeared on the lands of the wild field, on the border of the Christian and Muslim worlds, and the first notice about them is dated by 1492. Their clothes, weapons, haircut rendered samples of nomadic peoples. Sometimes ambassadors who visited the siege couldn't understand what kind of religion Cossacks were. It is necessary to remember that the similar formations would appear later on Don, on Kuban and on the Northern Caucasus, in the lower stream of the Volga and Iyak and even in Siberia. But the main distinction would become one thing. Only Ukrainian Cossacks were finally able to create their own state. According to Anatoly Strilenai, Cossack Dom existed both in the Ukrainian and in Russian history. But the Russian history can be written without Cossack Dom. At the same time, the Ukrainian one cannot be written without it. The main activity of Cossacks was military art. The Cossack host of Zaporizhia was famous for its high combat effectiveness and military mastership. It was conditioned by everyday military training, since the army was regular and the significant part of it always lived in Kurins, in the siege, a military camp. Cossack Dom could easily go along impossible roads of self-will and lose itself in death of anarchy. But due to the talented leaders, Ottomans, such as Dmitro Baida Vishnarevsky, Sahaidachny, Mikhailo Doroshenko, Cossack bands turned into the disciplined army. 
constant military threats and campaigns prompt hetmans, colonels, sotniks to the attitude of tolerance to ordinary Cossacks, formed bondmen, commoners, dunivassals. The authority of a Cossack was based on personal and real merits. The higher legislative authorities in the Zaporizhia host were the military council or Kola, and Korean meetings where the most important issues of military and political character were discussed and Starshana was elected. The main figure was the Ottoman of Kosh. His exclusive rights were to summon military councils, preside over council of elders, Starshins, to go into diplomatic affairs with foreign states, divide the military booties, etc. There were always along with him military scribe, a person responsible for all registry of Zaporizhka siege, the siege of Zaporizhia, military asavul, a person who monitored following the status rules by Cossacks of the siege, procured provisions in case of war, and was an investigator in court hearings. And there was always a military judge, Haranjai, Bunchuzhai, Pernachai, the real cabinet of ministers. All posts were elected. Higher power on the siege belonged to the siege council, where all Zaporizhci, Zaporizhian Cossacks, took part. The council was an example of direct democracy. All the Cossacks voted on the Maidan, meeting on the central square. It could be summoned not only by Ottoman of Kosh, but also by the Cossack Dome itself. When a new Ottoman was elected, the crowd put up several candidates for the post. After the candidate being elected, some highly respected Zaporizhian Cossacks went from the crowd and put on the head of the new Ottoman of Kosh dirt and litter, so that he was not overproud and remembered that all Zaporizhian Cossacks were his peers. When the Cossack state Hetmanchina was founded, Cossack military elders were divided into general, regiment and sotnya, Cossack cavalry squadron. That is to say that the Cossack regiment became a military and administrative unit, and Cossack colonels from that time on were both military commanders and administrative chiefs of different regions. From the very beginning of the Zaporizhia siege, the spirit of Kazakh Dome started spreading all over Ukraine. Having spent almost 20 years in the Eastern Europe, French military engineer Haim Baplin stated, Cossacks patiently love freedom. They consider deaths better than slavery. Philosopher Walter, in History of Karl XII, wrote, Ukraine, the country of Cossacks. Ukraine has always wanted freedom. The ideal picture of democratic principles in Cossack state formation was depicted by the constitution of Pelip Orlik, contracts and statement of right and freedom of Zaporizhia host. The main idea of the document was the thesis about the eternal right of the Ukrainian people for independence and free life. The Ukrainian Cossack Dome lasted for 300 years and the last 100 were within the Cossack state. They left the image of Ukraine as a free, unsubmissive, rich land. But the history of Ukrainian army is not only about Cossack Dome, it is about Knights of Rus, noble warriors at times of the Great Duchy of Lithuania and Rich Pospolita, heroes of liberating campaigns 1917-1921. It is our ancestors who fought in First and Second World Wars, and in absolute terms, it is our modern-day Ukrainian army, the best army in the world. Yeah!